Okay. Okay, we're on the cloud. <laughs> Welcome to the very first online session of the Associates. Well, technically, this isn't a general meeting because we didn't have authority um, to have one, and we will be able to have one for our AGM on June the 12th. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the gallery is located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. And we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory, and particularly when we can return physically to that territory where the gallery is situated. Our agenda today is quite short. Gallery Director John Tucker is here with us to provide a gallery update and Chief Curator Michelle Jakes will then give us a sneak preview of what's being exhibited at the gallery, followed by some questions from John. So I'd like to now introduce John Tucker. Thank you. Um, uh, hello to everybody. I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, I look forward to welcoming you back to the gallery sooner rather than later. Um, so the gallery's been closed, but we haven't stopped working. Uh, Michelle's going to be talking about, I think, some of her programs that her and her team have been working on. Uh, buildings and grounds have been going in there and fixing up the, the Asian garden and doing a lot of work that we kind of deferred maintenance work that was not put in place. Um, we're, there's only about five people working at the gallery at any one time, five or six people there. Most everybody else is working at home. Um, so we're putting together, installing some exhibitions, uh, and then we're also doing some work in the vaults and collection related work. I guess we were, after this whole COVID thing started, we are working at home. We received news from the federal government that they couldn't fund us for that capital project that we're talking about for such a long time. So uh, disappointing news, but not the end of the world. We're still going to go back to them for money because there's probably going to be some post-COVID uh, stimulus money around. So I'm pretty optimistic about that. Um, we uh, we started this project uh, at the gallery because we're, you know, the gallery's not doing, but we're taking advantage of some of the federal program funding, the emergency uh, wage subsidy funding. And so um, things are not bad for most people uh, in our sector, but f except for the artists, the individual artists can't sell the work, galleries aren't open to sell the work. So we decided that we would purchase some works by local artists and we've been going around, Haim has been going around to visiting the studios and well, remotely, I guess. And then, uh, but we're going to be buying some, buying some artwork and uh, we have a donor that's coming with some money for that to help us out. We've got some acquisitions money that we can we can use to purchase our artist's work because that's so that's really i'm really pleased with that uh it's we also developed the staff and developed what we call a reopening uh committee it's a group of uh, staff from different departments and we all get together remotely of course through zoom and uh we talk about how how we're drafting up some guidelines about what it will look like when we reopen so you'll probably see a new plexi shield there There'll be all kinds of markings on the floor. There'll be, you know, one door to get in, one door to go out. So we've got all this social distancing stuff in place. Uh, we're ready to submit these plans to the uh, WorkSafe BC tomorrow. That would be Thursday. Uh, and um, and once they give us approval, we should be by mid-May. We may we would likely be ready to open the gallery again to the public and so it'll be a bit of a different situation because there'll be a limited amount of people that can go into the gallery at any one time and Carol Ann I think if they're saying that we can't have groups of more than 50 people you may have to have another one of these uh, zoom uh, <laughs> monthly meetings but uh, other than that uh, I have to say things are better than I expected. Everybody seems to be working really hard. We're getting used to the new normal and uh, we'll see what, see what uh, Michelle has to say next about the programming that she's got in place. Michelle. Thank, thank you very much. I think that's very exciting and news um, that it could be opening so quickly. 
Um, so I know Michelle really needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Um, she's been the chief curator of the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria since 2012. Michelle's previously held curatorial positions in contemporary and Canadian art at the Art Gallery of Toronto. She holds a BAH in art history and psychology from Queen's University and an MA in art history from York University. And I know she's been working very closely with colleagues and other institutions across the country and elsewhere to develop new and very creative programming during the pandemic, including a great collaboration called Field Trip, which I think is very cool. And she's now going to give us a peek at what's waiting at the AGGV. Thanks, Michelle. My pleasure. And thank you for that nice introduction. And um, I hope everybody is is staying healthy. Um, yeah, after after the initial panic in March when we when we closed and uh, the uncertainty about how we were going to pivot to this new reality, um, now I'm a little bit sad about going back because we're having so much fun with the virtual programming. But I was actually just. Um, having an email exchange with the Duncan Ferguson, our preparator, about the fact that we might continue with, with some of this virtual programming. Um, for instance, we probably won't be able to do group tours at the gallery. So we're talking about whether there's a way that we could do um, video tours that we provide on YouTube that people could follow on their own devices when they come to the gallery. And of course, um, there will be limited numbers of people allowed into the gallery at, one, at any one time. And um, there are probably some people who will not feel comfortable coming to the gallery. So um, at first it seemed like we were being burdened with another layer of um, programming. We'd been balancing on-site programming and getting ready for the off-site programming that was going to um, uh, feed into the building project. And then we had virtual programming. But um, as I say, it has come to be something that we, we really appreciate. But I know that I'm speaking to an audience that really loves the physical space of the gallery and loves the collection. And um, when we go back, we will be focusing on um, uh, celebrating the collection. It's probably the safest thing to do rather than to start booking exhibitions or start making agreements with with artists because we're not really sure how things are going to unfold. We're not sure if there might be a second wave. So um, we are uh, featuring different parts of the collection in each of the gallery spaces. We already have um, a contemporary installation up. And what I'm going to show you right now is a, a little sneak peek at what is happening in the Centennial Gallery where we're celebrating the Canadian Historical Collection. So let's see how my technical skills go and whether I can share my desktop with you so that I can play this video for you. I think I have to figure out how to put you two away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, I wonder if I can do that. Let me just pause this. Okay. Great. We're on. I'm sure that like me, many of you are feeling a little strange about not being able to go to the gallery. I thought that I'd tell you about one of the installations that will be waiting for you when we are able to go back. The gallery usually dedicates its spaces for art to temporary exhibitions. Sometimes those exhibitions include works from the collection, 
but the gallery does not have Canadian galleries or contemporary galleries or an Asian wing the way many larger institutions do. Before COVID-19 forced our closure on March 17th, we were actually in the midst of installing the two largest galleries with works from the collection. We simply wanted to explore what it would feel like for the institution to have permanent collection galleries. You might wonder why we wanted to do this, and it's because such galleries allow you to work differently than when you're creating an exhibition. With the need for a curatorial thesis or a strict narrative put aside, you can bring all kinds of things out of the vault and explore many kinds of relationships between the works. This is a mock-up that I made in a design program of what the title wall in the lobby might look like with our permanent collection galleries. Instead of the title of an exhibition, we would simply have the different collecting areas pointed out with directional signage. In the Centennial Gallery, we've focused the installation on Canadian art. You'll recognize some of the works in this early part of the installation from the recently closed exhibition, Unformable Things, Emily Carr and Some Canadian Modernists. Um, works such as Lady in Red by Laura Muntz Lyle, probably from the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And works like Maxwell Bates' portrait of Marion Bates of 1929. What moving away from the strong curatorial narrative of unformable things towards a more general installation of Canadian historical art allows us to do is bring in the works that didn't quite fit into the thematic of Canadian modernism. Works such as this 1905 portrait of Paul, the artist's son by Sophie Pemberton. Although Pemberton was an almost exact peer of Emily Carr's, she was born in 1869, two years before Carr, because her work tends towards the academic rather than the modernist tradition, she wasn't included in Unformable Things. But here, in this suite of portraits with the Bates and the Munts, her work finds a fitting place. Another work that didn't quite fit the modernist definition that is fascinating nonetheless is this landscape by Grafton Tyler Brown. Brown was an African-American artist who, in 1882, moved from San Francisco to Victoria, where he worked as a professional artist and land surveyor for two years before moving back to the States. Tyler Brown was British Columbia's first professional black artist. He's a significant figure, and although he was prolific, the gallery only has one canvas by him. Furthermore, because his story is so unusual and doesn't really fit in with the way we normally think of British Columbia's art history, it's been difficult to find reasons to bring the canvas out of the vault. The installation includes works by many of the artists you'd expect to see in a gallery devoted to Canadian historical art, such as A.Y. Jackson. This painting, of course, was also in Unformable Things. Jackson is well known for his use of abstraction, and here we see him pushing the potential of that vocabulary to describe the landscape and northern lights of Alaska. By opening up the narrative in this installation, we were able to bring in this work by Niviaxiak, which makes a really interesting juxtaposition with the Jackson. 
Nibby Aksiak is also known for his use of abstraction. And here we see him using negative space and bright color in a really interesting way to also describe a northern landscape. The installation includes this new Emily car, an untitled canvas which depicts Finlayson Point, which was painted around 1936. Um, this was uh, an anonymous gift that the gallery received last year. One canvas that the installation doesn't include is Emily Carr's Odds and Ends, a favorite, I know, but it's currently being packed up to be sent to the McMichael Canadian Art Collection to be included in their exhibition, Uninvited Canadian Women Artists in the Modern Moment. This is one of their Group of Seven hundredth anniversary exhibitions. In a nod to the absence of Carr's odds and ends, we've included Dee Bradley Muir's large-scale photograph, Hilltop Odds and Ends of 2005, which is part of a series that he created in an exploration of the contemporary state of the landscapes that inspired Emily Carr. The installation closes with three small paintings by Maude Lewis. These works were donated to the gallery last year. They're the gift of Francis E. Rose, and they had been in Ms. Rose's family since being acquired directly from the artist at her infamous house in Nova Scotia. As we think about reopening the gallery post-pandemic, we'll be filling even more of the spaces with work from our collection. Focusing on the collection allows us to work with intimacy and fiscal responsibility. And it also allows us to easily manage the physical experiences that we're creating for our visitors as they start to venture back to the gallery. Apologies for my less than professional videography and video editing. But thanks to Stephen Topfer for his very professional photography of the collection, images of which have been used throughout this presentation. And thanks to you all for your attention and interest and for your ongoing support. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the gallery, hopefully sometime soon. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, learning, I have, you know, learning I have, new skills. <laughs> I have uh, thanks to the video that was really good. I was I have gone to see the exhibition, you know, as we've been closed and watched the installation. And, and like you, I mean, it, I don't know if I I'd like to. I guess I should admit it, but those juxtapositions of works when they sit beside another work it creates a whole other different meaning. And I know that's a real curatorial skill when this exhibition does it. That Tyler Grafton Brown piece, which is right beside another landscape piece, it really opens up another way of looking at art. So I'm really excited about that. I wonder if you could talk about uh, the Lauren Harris pieces that you put in the show. I can. <laughs> Do you have a particular question about them? I think I... I skirted around talking about them in the video because um, one of them 
is an anonymous gift and one of them is an anonymous loan. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're both, the, the, the anonymous gift is one of two that were received last year and I don't think they've been exhibited ever before. So it's gonna be great to see them. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I, you know that I have a very um, particular relationship with, with Lauren, Lauren Harris um, because I'm apparently one of the few people that thinks, I shouldn't say I'm one of the few people. Um, I'm one of the people who thinks that we should hoard his work and keep it all in Canada. And apparently I have lots of colleagues in the Canadian art world who think that we should just sell it and send it to American collectors. Um, but uh, we have had the, the Lauren Harris um, that is on loan to us for a number of years now. I think I've used it in every um, exhibition that I can use it in. I probably in it, it's probably in its fourth iteration now and it's um, just a beautiful, beautiful piece that the lender um, had meticulously restored by um, a conservator and uh, remarkably as part of that gift that the Emily Carr that I showed um, is part of, we got two more Lauren Harris's last, last year. Um, they're all sort of of that small scale. Uh, we don't have any of his sort of full canvases, but um, these are works that he would have painted um, out in the landscape in the in the Rockies. They're all rocky views, so relevant to the West Coast, even though Lauren Harris is uh, from Eastern Canada. And um, yeah, it's just it's remarkable that we're sort of slowly building this collection of pretty spectacular Lauren Harris's, so that we can do a little corner like like that. Um, having moved to Victoria from Toronto and having worked at the AGO where there was a whole Lauren Harris room. <laughs> uh, I admit I do have a soft spot for seeing lots of Lauren Harris's together. <laughs> He's a great painter. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little about, because uh, I know that Hun Wu is working on a exhibition now. This will be our first, her first exhibition as curator of uh, Asian art for the gallery. Uh, do you um, have any ideas about what she's going to be showing? She is going to be focusing, she, she sort of ran through a number of options and I had sort of suggested that she do something um, out of uh, the Chinese art collection, just knowing that that's her area of expertise. But um, she's actually, uh, you know, sort of developed such a rapport with Barry, they've been talking and um, uh, she was, she has been quite concerned as Barry is about the fact that there are so many um, recent acquisitions that haven't been seen yet. She didn't want to sort of focus in too much on one particular um, area in the Asian collection. So what she will be doing is a um, recent acquisition show. The last time we did one was I think 2015 or 2016. So it's been about five years. She said, I can't believe this, but she said a thousand works have been added to the Asian collection <laughs> since the last time we did one of these shows. So she has her work cut out for her to sort of work through that and figure out what will make an interesting installation. And of course, um, Barry is famous for installations that use every possible square inch of wall and floor. And she won't be able to do a show like that because we have to leave um, enough space for people to be in there with physical distancing. Um, but I think she'll come up with something very, very fascinating and, and unique. And I just, I, I love the way that she's working closely with Barry, but she also definitely has her own vision for the collection. 
Thanks, Michelle. Um, final question. Um, some people may know this, but Michelle's been very involved with an association of art museum directors and an international group of, of art museum directors. And they just, she just finished the conference yesterday. And I wonder if you could talk a little about how it went. I mean, it was a, it's a virtual conference with a lot of people, hundreds of people. Yeah, it, uh, the Association of Art Museum Curators um, is an international organization, but with the head offices in New York. So admittedly, it's a little bit um, US focused. Um, but um, remarkably, because the conference had to go virtual, and it was supposed to be in Seattle. So um, it was determined quite early on that we wouldn't be going there um, since Seattle was hit by COVID-19 so early. Um, but because the conference went virtual, um, there were people in attendance from 18 countries, which I think is the greatest, widest representation that we've, we've ever had. And um, people really, even though the, the content was determined so long ago, it was really interesting how so many questions were able to respond to our current situation. So, you know, there was a panel on uh, working across borders, or there was a panel on the fact that a lot of institutions now have a curator of global arts. So really when you, when you start to think about it, everything, um, any topic in the museum field is going to be touched by our, our new reality. And uh, the conference went virtual, but I think moving forward, a lot of the work that we do is going to have to change as we start to question um, whether it's really possible to travel as much as we have been or to ship shows around the world. Um, but the conference was incredibly successful and um, while I missed the aspect of the conference that um, is so about the socializing, I've been involved in this organization since 2010, I think. So I have a lot of friends that I only see when I attend the AAMC conference. Um, of course, I missed that, but um, I have to say that there's something very um, intimate about sitting you know, as far as you are away from your computer and listening to people talk about um, the issues that, that are so meaningful to all of us who work in museums. Um, it was very intimate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, Michelle, that, that made me feel homesick. <laughs> the gallery. So what a great sneak preview. Thank you so much. Maybe, maybe that will become a normal thing to do, a little virtual pre-tour. Um, Michelle has generously offered to accept questions from anyone with questions. So if you have a question for Michelle, please email it to her by the end of Tuesday, May 12th at the gallery, which is M. Jake's at aggv.ca and we'll gather up all the questions and answers and send them out to all the associates and I would um, really like to thank John and Michelle for making this pilot session for us. I hope everyone watching it will enjoy it as, as much as I have being part of it. Um, we'll look forward to our own AGM which will actually be a Zoom meeting on June 12th and is an opportunity for us to hear from virtually from Dr. Hung Wu, the new Asian art curator. So this ends our session for today. Thank you very much for watching. Stay safe and well and goodbye.